do. We wanted to um, recognize the one, there's going to be a one minute silence um, being held at 12 o'clock in memory of those who have died during the coronavirus pandemic. So we're going to mark that silence before we begin the main session. Okay, well, get started now. So I'd like to introduce onto the virtual stage three incredibly distinguished um, experts in their fields. Um, Jim Berry, director of the UCL MBA. Uh, Jennifer Verbier is the head of employee experience engagement and inclusion at Virgin Media. And last but not least, Elaine Bremner, chief people officer at Mediacom. Thank you all so much for joining today. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. And before we get into it, I'd love uh, for you each to briefly introduce yourselves and perhaps we'll go in reverse order. So Elaine, you, you first. Hi everybody. Um, so I'm Elaine Bremner and as Nick said, I'm the Chief People Officer for Mediacom in the UK. So we are a media planning and buying agency, about 1500 people across five offices. Um, I am a mum of three, so I've got three kids, 18, six and three, so I've got my handful there. I'm um, avid Sunderland fan, so very happy about the result last week, um, and originally from Durham. Thank you so much. Uh, Jennifer, over to you. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Fevers. I look after employee experience, so the whole value chain around the employee experience at Virgin Media, um, and that includes employee engagement, so our employee insights and inclusion, which what we call at Virgin Media is belonging. Um, I've been at Virgin Media about three years, um, previously worked at BP and a couple of strategy houses, um, so really enjoying the Virgin Media culture that we are that we have and we're creating into the future. But um, I'm also a mum of three, um, originally from Scotland and Fife in Scotland, um, but I've been down south because it's quite frankly just quite a lot warmer. <laughs> Thank you. And Jim, over to you. And I, I'm Jim Berry. I'm the director of the UCL MBA. I'm a faculty member at University College London School of Management. Uh, and my specialty is organizational behavior. And uh, I primarily research innovation and change. And when we think about our innovation and change, that, that often creates disruption in people's lives. Um, I'm a little outnumbered. I'm only a father of one, uh, but she's a teenager. So believe me, there's, there's some resilience needed in our household uh, as we go forward. And as you can probably hear by my accent, I am American, but I just found out this week that I am offered British citizenship and will take my ceremony this Thursday. So American by birth, British by uh, choice. Congratulations. I, someone was sharing with me some of the questions for the, um, the, the, the test recently, and I think your, your knowledge of uh, British history is probably going to surpass uh, most of us uh, from the sounds of that uh, process. But um, <laughs> well, thank you all so much and uh, excited to be speaking today um, uh, about this incredibly important topic. But, but I thought perhaps before we do, I would just 
I think resilience is spoken about a lot and sometimes without a grounding definition. Um, and I thought it might be helpful to have a grounding definition. Um, there's one that we particularly like at Unmind uh, by Panta and Brick, uh, sorry, Panta Brick and Lechman uh, from 2013. Um, and it defines resilience as being a process to harness resources to sustain well being. Uh, which I particularly like because one, it's short, and I think most definitions that are shorter are quite useful. Um, but also, I think it really ties it back to the the importance of resources um, and and the role that those resources in our lives can play in our ability to maintain our well being. Um, so I thought before um, before I go into the how it's impacted how the organisations have been affected by uh, COVID and the recent events, be interested to ask your opinion as to whether that definition resonates, uh, whether it's how you talk about resilience internally, either a uh, Jim from a, a kind of university perspective uh, or Jen and Elaine from an organizational perspective. Yeah, uh, I, I, think, I think that definition does work, but um, I think I've got even a simpler way. There was a toy when I grew up, it was called a Weeble Wobble. I don't know if you had it, it was weighted at the bottom. And if you pushed it over, it then returned back to the upright state and it would kind of wobble a little bit. That to me is resilience. If, if the upright state is your comfort zone, is where you operate and, and you feel healthy, uh, then resilience is when you get knocked back by something, how quickly and how well do you have systems in place to bring you back upright? Um, and so that's something that we deal with our teams quite quite frequently is, you know, we start meetings with, how is everyone? Where, where are we going? Um, and I think just that, that personal knowledge is, is part of understanding, uh, you know, how resilient people are and what makes them resilient uh, as we go. So getting- uh, I love that. And I've now got stuck in my head. I, I didn't have that talk, but I can just <laughs> imagine it. And it's a, it, it works really well uh, as a definition. Elaine, how about you? Yeah, um, I did have those toys. I remember them well. Um, I like your definition, Nick, because um, the slight concern I have about the sort of definition about the ability to bounce back, you know, in the, yep. in the, in the face of adversity, from a, from a workplace perspective, I think sometimes that puts too much onus on the individual because mm -hmm. I don't want to have a business whereby we're sort of putting people under extreme trauma and adversity that they've got to bounce back from. Um, so I feel like your definition, Nick, in terms of, you know, that system of well-being is, is more aligned to what we're thinking. Because, as I said, I feel like if you're constantly saying to the individual, you need to be more resilient, you need to bounce back, let's send you on a resilience course because it's all about you. It takes away from um, the responsibility of the organisation not to put people into those experiences. Mm -hmm. And I think... The other sort of lens on that is from an inclusion perspective. If you look at that, you know, we know that people have different lived experiences and if they're from minority groups, much worse than if you're not. And so you could look at that face value and think those people are less resilient, but actually the truth of it is they're just having a much more difficult time. So again, I think as an organization, we've got to look at sort of collective resilience and really look at the reasons behind why people are feeling that they need to bounce back rather than just putting it all on the individual. Thank you. Um, and Jen, how about for you? I, th I think it's interesting. I think we've talked about resilience for, for years in organisations, haven't we? But actually, interestingly, at Verge Media, we haven't talked about resilience that much in the last 18 months. We've Because it's that's the outcome, isn't it? That's the that's where everybody wants wants to be and, and, and feel resilient. But actually, we focus much more the conversation and the narrative around the input, the well-being, your mental health, your physical health, your social, your financial health. Um, so actually, we've we've flipped it. So we don't talk about resilience actually anymore. We talk about the inputs and and how and how how many of those inputs are are in in a good place and and, and how are you managing and juggling those. Because actually those are the building blocks and the foundations for resilience and resilience is just is an output. Um, so I think that's that's the change in the narrative that I've noticed in the last couple of years. I'll, I'll stay on that theme because I think I think it's a great theme. One of the, uh, the things that's always troubled me in my background, I'm, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've, spent, I've worked in 
at many charities and I've worked in the NHS and in many universities. And, and what's always bothered me is the way that mental health is portrayed. And, um, you know, this idea that still the dominant image for mental health, and it is changing, thankfully, is a kind of black and white image of someone holding their head in their hands. And, and I don't know at what point we took the colour out of images for people with mental health problems, but I've never met anyone in black and white in all my clinical experience. I don't know at what point we thought that was sensible, but, but uh, I've always thought, why is it when we're able to make in our society a kind of toothbrush, a sexier product than anything to do with mental health. And like teeth are pretty standard, you know, my dog has teeth, but I'm the only, you know, we as a species, are the only ones to have the brains that we have. And it's an amazing thing. And there's something about, there's something about resilience. And it's maybe a bit controversial that makes me think it's a bit unambitious in how we can position this topic um, because, I don't know, I, I've been, I have been persuaded to sign up for numerous very expensive gyms in my life. Um, and they have never been sold to me, to me on the basis that give us 40 quid a, a month and you'll be able to be a bit more resistance to tripping over and spraining your ankle. Uh, you'll be a bit more, less likely to develop a heart problem. They've all, it's always been, you'll get really fit and healthy. You'll be your strongest self. And I kind of feel with mental health, we've gone from the black and white image of this and the kind of middle ground is resilience. And I just think, Jen, to your point, now you're not using that language, is there actually a better way to be talking about what we're trying to achieve with resilience? And I'll put that out there for, for comment. You might well say, well, Nick, that's ridiculous. I, um, I, no, I think that's absolutely right. I, I think we talk about we talk about what, what do you need to thrive, right? So actually we don't just want a an organization full of lovely people that just feel resilient we want an organization where people feel they can really thrive so that's that's being far more ambitious isn't it and it's around what those building blocks are for them personally to thrive so thriving is and I think many workplaces have picked that up now and are running with it um and, and actually it's not just thriving in your, it's, it's about bringing your being able to bring your whole self so having a psychological safe place to work and actually, what are the building blocks you need to thrive? How can you be yourself here at work and bring out your best? I really love that idea. And, and, and Jim, I, I imagine you must see um, a lot of incredibly bright people, maybe perhaps at the earlier stage of their careers, coming through into the workplace and thinking, right, I'm going to do my MBA and then go on to X, Y, and Z. Um, do you, have you noticed a change in your students view on what they expect the workplace to provide them and that idea that Jen's talking about of actually it's not enough that my workplace is just paying the bills now my workplace should allow me to really be the best version of myself that I can be and it's actually the responsibility of my organization to in part facilitate that. Yeah, I, I think there has been a shift in how the conversation is, is discussed uh, generationally. Um, we, with the, the rise of, pop, of positive psychology, uh, this, this wellness component is, is not just a single issue. And I, I, I want to uh, commend Elaine on this. It, it's, not, it's not on the individual, it's, it's multiple aspects. And I also even want to broaden that out. It's not just an individual. It's, I, as an individual, have a work self. I have a home self. I have a, a friendship self. I have a, a football self. Um, and so I can have disruption in my life in different areas and I could be very positive in different areas. So, um, I think that holistic view that Jen is talking about it is really where we're going. Um, and it, it, it is interesting in our MBA program, we have students who are 60 years old and we have students who are 30. Um, and that communication, I don't think is really different. I think everybody is now looking for that holistic view. They want to have a positive impact. They, they want to, a job to have meaning. And I think if you have that, uh, that helps you be resilient in a number of different ways um, if you're adding positive value to society. I, I think that, that, that's absolutely uh, fascinating to think that different generations are perceiving this in the same way this is not just a kind of a generational division in the workplace and and I think there's there's an interesting topic here around how different generations are sometimes perceived if we go back to that idea of resilience and and that I think I'm, it's fair to say that some generations are perceived as being less resilient than other generations 
Elaine, is that something that you kind of, from a, a kind of CPO perspective, you're aware of that narrative in your career? Have you seen that? You know, is that something you had to actively address? Uh, do you have an opinion on that? Yeah. Love to, to hand it. Yeah, I mean, we have actively addressed it. So we've got a really young workforce, and there is that um, assumption and sort of um, not real view, actually, that you know, millennials, they call, we, people refer to them as snowflakes saying that they've got no resilience. And, and I just fundamentally disagree with that. And we've done a lot of work around, in terms of our sort of belonging strategy and our inclusion strategy around microaggressions. And, you know, that is a microaggression. Saying someone who's young has got no resilience is, is a microaggression. And we are really clear at Mediacom that we want to sort of address that. So we look at microaggressions across the board, whether that's around gender, ethnicity, sexuality, age. And we've put a programme in around allyship to really make sure that people are able to call that out or call that in and stand up for each other if those things are going on. And I think that, you know, goes back to my point earlier about collective resilience. It's all of our roles really to make sure that we're standing up for each other and, and building that resilience in each other as well as sort of expecting it from a personal perspective. Uh, it, 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 I remember very clearly you know, growing up and going through all of the different exam stages and the one almost kind of absolute reliable comment that I used to get from people who had been through it a few years earlier was oh it was much harder in my day uh, and this idea that somehow um, as you get older in life the perception is that the people coming up behind you are repeating exactly what you experienced um, the reality is growing up in today's world is very different to what it was like growing up 40 years ago and we've got all of the onslaught of the digital world and the, you know all of these challenges that actually uh, the younger generations have had to face that older generations have no idea about um, but I think this idea of microaggressions is very interesting um, because, and I'll come on to uh, uh, I'll go on to talk about it more in a moment, but before I do, could I ask you to give a definition of, for people who maybe haven't heard that term before, um, as to how to understand it? Yeah, it's, it's a sort of, can be an everyday slight or comment or um, behaviour towards someone that is based around their individual characteristic that will have a negative impact. And the reason it's called microaggressions when actually macro might be a better word for it, is that often people experience lots of them during the course of even a day and they add up. So they're sort of small um, instances, but they have a huge impact on people and on people's belonging and sense of self. So, um, yeah, that, that's how I would define it. But please uh, feel free to, to correct me. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great definition. I think it's interesting to think about how, going back to Jim's, uh, comment about resilience is the toy almost you can imagine lots and lots of microaggressions actually just pushing someone over and, and yeah exactly and the energy it just taking your energy away I mean not not only should that not exist by default the, the, those microaggressions but actually you can see how they would impact on somebody's ability to to be their best selves uh, Jen is it something that, that you've spoken about at Virgin Media as microaggression something that you also think about as a topic or do you use different language to describe it yeah, so microaggression, we, we, we've bring in some training around microaggression and allyship, just as Elaine is doing as well. And, and, and we do have, we have huge generations it, it, it within Virgin Media. And we, you know, the younger generation in Virgin Media, of which we have quite a large amount of them, um, you know, they are much more comfortable talking about their mental well-being. They're much more comfortable to step forward and say, I need help or um, I need some advice or I need a mentor. The older generation are just not, you know, they, 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 they did not grow up in an environment where they brought their whole selves to work. They brought their work selves to work. Yep. As soon as they left, it was absolutely left at the door. So, um, you know, they didn't bring anything to do with home and to work. They were almost a different person. So, so that, that is creating possibly that kind of disconnect, if you like, but um, I think the, the belonging strategy that we have is, is around not only just bringing in an diverse talent, but the, the, we've got a strong pillar around psychological safety and, and to create that for everybody and for everyone to feel a sense of belonging. Because um, inclusion is a topic that obviously we've all been talking about for, for a long time. 
but actually inclusion certainly in our organization you know 70 70 about 70 percent of our organization is white and male so actually inclusion is something that happened over here and it was it wasn't a topic they engaged with so when we changed it to belonging and that sense of um everybody can remember a time where they feel they possibly didn't belong um they, they start to re-engage and, and connect. Um, but microaggressions can be anything. You know, we've had comments from some of our networks in the past that have said, you know, you know, they've you know, maybe some from the underrepresented ethnic group network has come in and, and reheated a curry from the night before. And someone else has said, oh my gosh, the whole kitchen stinks now of curry. Now that that is a micro, I mean it may be a fact, but it's also a microaggression because that person that has heated up that meal for their lunch now feels like I can't bring in a curry so, you know so it, it's just educating our population around some of these things to be more inclusive more respectful quite frankly um and and I, I, de different generations are reacting differently to it and learning so much more you know we're trying to open up their eyes but to, they're everybody's super curious and we also know we've you know in the main people always come from a generally try to come from a good place you know they're not coming generally from a bad place so if they do say something we're needing to call it out and say actually you know we, we need to reframe that i think there's something interesting in that the word belonging and respect that you meant those two words actually really can be uh, very influential in creating a psychologically safe uh, workplace and um, i think it's a I'm probably I'm sure I wasn't alone this morning I woke up I turned the, the news on and I heard the news that it's one year uh, that we've now been in this um, new world of uh, the health pandemic and a strange thing to reflect on and obviously having the minute silence at the beginning of this session um, to, to think on it and I'm sure we'll all do a lot more thinking throughout the day it suddenly has required an awful lot of resilience from everyone um, to get through this. And it's been an incredibly taxing and difficult time. Um, and even, um, I think I, I've yet to meet anyone that hasn't been impacted by some way um, as a result of COVID, either directly experiencing COVID, having loved ones experience it, being uh, uh, grieving for, for someone you might've lost or someone who's died. Um, and, and, and also the huge impact on our work and our family life. Um, there is also, I think, a glimmer of um, hope about the fact we might be turning a corner. Um, obviously, in the UK, the, the vaccine program appears to have been a very fast uh, program and successful to date. And, um, and there is maybe talk now of a transition back to a, a new normal. Um, I think I'm also probably not alone in saying I'm a little anxious about that. Um, and it's a daunting prospect. Uh, I'm wondering, um, if that something that resonates with you, the three of you. Yeah, actually, um, I hired two new people while in lockdown. Uh, two people new to my team that I have never physically met before, that the rest of my team has never met before. And so when you're talking, Jen, about belonging, you know, how do you bring somebody new into your team that the rest of the team has has physically been in the same location? We've done lunches, we've had birthday parties, we've done these other things, and now you're bringing some people in who who never had that experience. And 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 how do you create that belonging environment? Um, and now we're potentially going back to an office that some of them have never. We talk about going back to an office. Some of my people have never been in the office at least not our office. So, so, you know, there's, there's multiple levels of, of issues that have to have to be dealt with here. And I think that's something as a leader and a manager is Elaine brought this up. Jennifer did too. It's, it's getting to know your, your team and your staffs as individuals and what they individually need um, so that you can support them where they are. I think it is a big part of, of what we as, as leaders and managers need to be doing and thinking about. Um, and so, yeah, it, it's going to be different. I'm looking forward to hearing what Elaine and Jennifer have to say. I mean, look, I think that people are going to be facing sort of situational anxiety, even just thought of getting on the tube. I think some people are worried about that. And I, I think we just have to sort of put our arms around people and, and not, make people feel that they're wrong in that you know sometimes you sort of you 
I was reading a list of all the things you need to be resilient and it's exhausting, you know, sort of thinking about that. And I think actually we've just got to sort of say to people, we know it's going to be challenging. People's expectations of what we're coming back to is so different um, in terms of, you know, how we're going to work, the flexibility that people are requiring. And I think I said this earlier when I was chatting to one of my friends about this, I don't know how you guys feel, but I sort of feel like I've got a bit of Stockholm syndrome to lockdown, you know, I sort of didn't want to be locked down, but, but it's sort of, you've got a bit used to it. And, you know, I heard someone talking the other day about the fact that we've forgotten how to have eye contact with people. And, you know, the whole thing is really changed. I was reading that. So it's a year today, isn't it? And I think I wrote this down. It was 8,760 hours that we've been in lockdown. And I feel like the majority of those have been on teams and zoom calls so, you know, what's it going to be like doing this kind of thing in the real world, actually seeing people again? But I would say I think we're all incredibly able to adapt to change really quickly. You know, look how quickly we all got into lockdown, as difficult as it might have been. So I do have hope that actually we'll all just sort of get back to back to normal and it'll be a new normal. But I think that I don't want to overthink it. I think, you know, we'll get back and we'll be all right. And that, I think... Jen. That, that transition is going to be interesting isn't it and how how we give people enough space to transition it in in their own time um but I, i'm sure elaine you're you're in the same situation where we're looking at the kind of future world of work how are we going to work going forward um and, and we have this framework around me time and we time so me time is you know stay at home work from home if that's easier for you but when when it's wee time and you get together and you have to do something that's creative and innovative and um or a workshop get together but that may no longer be once or you know once or twice a week it might be once or twice a fortnight or once and twice a month so depending on how you and your team want to work all of a sudden this flexibility book has been you know opened up and everybody's like oh okay this is this could this for all the things that we um, have to juggle in and outside of work. Um, you know, we've just signed up with Caters UK. That's our new sustainability partner for the next five years to really help us connect in with, because actually so many more people in our organisation across our, our all our businesses will be carers now because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, how do we bring them into the conversation? How do we make sure that we create a work environment that they can sustain? I, it's what I was really struck by as, as the three of you were talking was that um, first off, I was you know nodding if not physically internally to everything that was being said, but also I was struck by well, there's an awful lot of topics here that we could probably do a whole session on each of them specifically. Uh, you know, Jim, I, I think that's fascinating to think that there are many people for whom have uh, they've never seen the workplace for their new companies um, and. What does that mean? It's like a second re reintroduction to the business or, or organization. And um, Elaine, this idea of eye contact, I'm truly fascinated by that. Um, and I think that there could be something about the, because now the reality is most of the time you're either intentionally looking into the camera like this, in which case it feels like you're, you've got eye contact or you're looking at somebody's picture, in which case they're no longer looking at you. So we've kind of lost that ability to naturally do eye contact in work settings. Will we find it totally exhausting to go back into a full day where we're interacting physically with one another again? Will that be psychologically tiring? But also that idea that you've commented on about um, you know, not overthinking it. There, there's something, we were kind of forced to react quickly to introduction to, to lockdown, but we've now had a full year to think about returning to work. Um, and there's something about overthinking jumping in a pool of cold water um, and sometimes just making the jump is the right thing to do. But there's probably a fine line between the two. And, and Jen, I think your, your topic around how, you know, there is a collaborative role for a workplace and an individual role for focus at home for those people that have a home environment that can facilitate that. But I guess what this speaks to is, my goodness, it's complicated. Um, and it's, it's going to have to be a case by case basis for organizations. But I'm wondering, I think most people I've spoken with have taken some positives from the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, it, even if there's been lots of bad things in their life, they've been able to say, well, actually, I prefer this now about my working life. Are there things that, that you think are 
going to be pulled out of this lockdown world into the new world of work that will enhance work and ultimately potentially impact on well-being in a positive way? I mean, I, I think. Go for it. Oh, I sorry, mean, Jen. So I think we're going to have more Zoom meetings than we probably had before, um, because it's more inclusive, and and we may not we're more likely to be possibly at home than in the office. So, um, and I think we're trying to ensure that we have some etiquette that actually I think do you remember the days where everybody was in the office and you were the one person having to dial into that meeting and it was horrendous experience right you couldn't talk you probably didn't have a camera you were dialing in on the phone and you were trying to get into conversations and add add value um and it was just a horrible experience I don't think that's going to happen now so it's either you're either all in the office or you're all on zoom and even though there's some people in the office the meeting will be on zoom um so or, or whatever platform you use. So I think that's, I actually think that's more inclusive. I, I, you know, I've just hired two new people into my team and they're both based up in Manchester and Birmingham. You know, two years ago, we were looking for team members in the, in the South really so that they could access um, Reading on a regular basis. But now that doesn't, doesn't we don't need that, right? So um, the, the, the ability to go out and reach out for talent further afield is just brilliant. So possibly more autonomy uh, in terms of people's choice of where to live uh, for their work. Uh, Elaine, I think you were going to say something. Yeah, I think I do think this sort of culture of care that we've all put around our people is going to come into the new workplace. So, you know, we've been having conversations around mental health for a long time. And, you know, our second sort of journey on that was to um, partner with you guys at Unmind to provide people with that well-being um, content and, and the sort of support but I think you know we're we're really conscious now of people's well-being and mental health and I think that will go back with us into the workforce so Jim your point about you know asking people how they are and then maybe asking them again how they really are um, will continue and you know the things that we've put in place so during lockdown um, well for the last whole year we've had sort of mental health check-ins so we've just had our mental health allies available on Teams calls where people can just come and go as they please a couple of times a week just to have a conversation. And it might just be to talk about whether they watched Line of Duty on Sunday, but it, but you know, it's, it's, it's just a, a way for people to connect and check in outside of work. So I think that will continue. Um, and, and just that, yeah, that sort of culture of care and just making sure that we're looking after each other will, will definitely carry on, I, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's there's two very significant macro trends um, around well-being at the moment. One is bad and one is good. I think the bad one is the yeah the, the, the scale of the problem has got bigger um, because you know, um, all areas of life have been impacted by COVID, be it your finances, your home life, your work life, etc. And therefore, we are seeing an increased prevalence, very sadly, of mental illnesses. The, the, the good side there is that I think that the shackles of stigma that have held this topic back for such a long time have fallen away faster than they were naturally doing so. And I think that has allowed an environment uh, for a more open and normalized conversation around mental health. And, I, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be retained in, in the workforce. Jim, I think uh, over to you, I think you can say something. Yeah, I, I think this is an interesting piece. Anytime you've got change, and I, I think this is something that we're, we're dealing with right now is, uh, you know, we've had a radical change. All of us have had a radical change to our work environments, whether we were going to the office every day or whether you know, there are still some people going to the office every day right now, people who are working in supermarkets, people who are working, you know, in transportation are, are going in every day. But there's they're seeing a change in their work environment very dramatically. I was in Canary Wharf a, a couple of weeks ago and it was a ghost town. It was a, I was there. I was at work, but work wasn't the same. But I think it's what we learn from these changes and things that Jennifer is mentioning in Elaine about, you know, being more comfortable in a distant environment, having uh, not feeling weird being the odd person calling in. I think there are going to be shifts. I don't I don't envision us all going back to the office. What I'm looking at here is I think we've all become a little bit more flexible 
and maybe our organizations need to be able to be more flexible as well. And that allows us to do things like accessing a broader array of talent, um, hiring people who don't physically have to be in the office, um, allows us to broaden out that capability. But I want to say there's something else that links to this mental health, and it goes back to, as a leader, being a person and, and recognizing that the people you hire are people too. They're not resources. They are people. And you're in my home right now. This is this is part of my home, you know. And the odd things that happen. We've all seen the dog walk in, the child walk in. Um, this has given us potentially an opportunity to get to know each other in a slightly different way than we did in the office. So I don't think it, it all has to be that we've been all isolated. Maybe we've just had a different view at each other, a different angle. I feel that's really um, important for our business as well, because we've been in our clients' homes. Yeah. So it, it's brought us much closer to our clients. And we've seen that sort of our client satisfaction levels have just gone up and up and up during last year. So I think, you know, like you say, seeing people's dogs and kids and shark pictures or whatever it might be, that has brought us closer to clients, definitely. It's kind of really made that work-life boundary concept um, less defined, um, which I think is good and bad in some ways. And um, I, I think one of the one of the, the topics we consider at Unmind, and, and I'm certainly very guilty of this actually is um, my commuting hours and our working hours. So I start the day at 7 a.m. and I finish the day at 7 p.m. And, and I love it and I do it by choice and that's fine. But, but at the same time, it's going to be quite difficult to get the same amount of work done in commuting hours. Um, which is, is so, and I'm wondering what preparations do we need to do to equip our people with the right mindset and skill set in this potentially new blended world of work where our home life and our personal life is close and our work life is closer, where our um, home working and office working is more flexible, um, where virtual and in-person is blended. Like what do we need to empower people to be ready for this or do we think that they will just adjust? I think we need to empower managers to be able to manage people remotely and manage people on output and not presenteeism. That's a that's a huge thing. And within that comes a um, a need for trust. And I think, you know, a lot of organisations have it to some extent, but not as much as they need to. And I think, again, that goes back to resilience, doesn't it? Because if you've got a environment where there's trust, it means that you can fail and then learn from those failures and move on. Um, so I think that's really important for resilience generally, but back to the sort of how we equip people and empower people, my um, focus is really to make sure that our managers know how to manage people properly remotely and, and that people don't feel guilty for sort of taking a lunch break when they're working from home, because to your point, Nick, I think people are getting burnt out, you know, I'm, I'm working sort of, I'm in back to back meetings all day long, which you just wouldn't have if you were at work, because you'd have to, you'd, at least you'd be able to walk to the meeting and think about what you're going to say in your next meeting before the first one finishes. So we're just, it's relentless at the minute. And I think we've got to all just take a step back and realise there probably will be an impact on, on efficiency and output because of that but you know good because at the minute I think everyone is just working flat out and it's and it's not sustainable and it won't work when we're all back in the office yeah there there oh, was a huge good. jump in productivity when we all started working from home and I think that was some of that that we're not commuting anymore we can add that to work but we've seen uh, over time that's started to tail off and I think some of that is yeah, we can all work more, but where is that boundary between home and work now? And so, you know, while we may not have our office doors in front of us, we probably need to create structures as organizations, as leaders of organizations as to when is it appropriate to communicate? When is it appropriate to, to, to know when somebody is available? Uh, we actually have done this with our MBA students and said, OK, you need to set up a communications plan with your team as to, you know, when is it appropriate to communicate and, and, and you know, at what level? Um, you know, if I send an email, do I should I expect a synchronous response? You know, e email is not meant to be a, 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 you know, a piece going back and forth. So at, at, at what kind of communication should we do and at what times? 
Um, I have, I have a rule. I actually will not email somebody who works for me after three o'clock on Friday. I won't do it. Um, if it's an emergency, I will, I will reach out another way, but other than an emergency, they're not going to hear from me at that point. That's their own time. Uh, I want to give them their own space. That's a, that's a, a lovely idea and a good takeaway as well um, for people. But we, um, I'm wondering, uh, some questions have come in, so I'll, I'll make some space for questions because there's some really good ones coming in. Um, I think we'll probably all align around this answer, but it's a topic that's worth raising. And the question is, is it really possible for individuals to thrive if, if still operating on old frameworks involving such long hours? And that's from Jane Morris, who's the author of Burnout to Brilliance. I'm curious to know your opinions of that. I, I, don't, I don't think it is. Um, I, we've certainly seen it Virgin Media that, um, and actually the Unmind app has given us the ability to actually see how, how big our population, how they're feeling um, and actually tired and anxious have been the, the, the two predominant feelings throughout COVID from our population through the Unmind app. So we have, you know, in, in order, because we know we can see that people are working longer hours, we have created gold, the lunch golden hour and we're protecting the golden hour. So there are no meetings, no calls, no nothing between 12 and one in Virgin Media every single day. Um, and uh, every fortnight, you know, no company meetings after lunchtime on a Friday. So we're, we're having to put other things in place to help um, to help give our people permission to slow down or stop. Um, because even though line managers and leaders are saying, look after yourself, own it, you know, manage your day make sure you get time to get outside and go for a walk, et cetera, if you can, um, or, or, you know, find, get some time to read. Um, people are not doing it. They're, they're, they're just churning through the work, um, which, is in, which is incredible, but it's not good and it's not sustainable. So, um, but we're having to put these real initiatives in place and mandating them in order to help people give themselves that permission. I guess it's the it's it's not just the commuting hours, is it? Because it's also the fact that all the pubs and restaurants and social events and opportunity to socialise with people they've all gone, and therefore work suddenly becomes the one stable part of our life. And another very important question that's come in: we've only got three minutes left, so but there is a, a key topic. Um, there, there's an issue around social mobility and who does genuinely have the choice of work remotely and flexibly. I think it's important to, to, to mention this in any conversation around this topic, that there are people for whom this idea of a blended life really doesn't fit what they want or can achieve. Um, so how do we create a future of work that is inclusive for all people um, and so that not the, those that get the benefits are not those people for whom they have the space or the finances or opportunity to live that blend that, that blended work life balance. Elaine, over to you. I, th I think you've just got to make sure that you don't have a standard approach. It's the same with anything in terms of inclusion. You can't have one size fits all because we are not all the same size. So we're really conscious of it. You know, it's all very well if you've got an office at home, but we've got loads of our people that are sharing flats. They're working from their bedrooms. They've had to move back home. You know, they've got nowhere to work. And what we're really conscious of is that you don't want to have this sort of two-tiered system where you've got some people that are forced to be back at work and some people that are able to work at home. But equally, what we're also finding, because, you know, we've surveyed our people in terms of whether they want to come back and, and what they're missing from work. And what we are finding is that, um, and there is this, there does seem to be a bit of a generation gap here is that the younger people, they, they want to be back at work, you know, they can't wait to get back because to your point, Nick, they sort of, it's a social environment for people as well. And they want to see their mates, they want to, you know, learn from each other. And I think that's a really, another really important point is that, you know, if you're at the beginning of your career, you learn by osmosis, right? You learn because you're next to people and you're seeing them and you're, you know, having sort of interactions that are more serendipitous and, you you, you know, you're, do, you're doing things that are not just standardised calls back to back. So you're learning from each other in that way and, and you need to be back to do that. Yeah, there, there are advantages to being the one in the office. And so there, you know, I, I almost think that that um, 
we're, we're seeing this with, with finance professionals. You're, there are a number of stories about finance professionals early in their career working 90 some hours you know, in order to do that advancement. But when we're talking about going to the office versus being virtual, if you're in front of the boss, you're more likely to get you know, a new opportunity comes in. Well, who can I give it to? I'm going to give it to the person who's sitting right there because you're in my face. So it's, uh, it's, it's not just the people who have to be at the office. It's the people who have to work remotely might be disenfranchised as well. Super. We are sadly out of time and it has been such a fascinating conversation. So thank you all so much for sharing your insights and wisdom on, on the topic. And I could certainly sit here and talk for many more hours uh, with you. So um, thank you and I um, hope you all have a, a great rest of the day. And thank you everyone for, for streaming in on this, uh, this uh, um, conversation. Thank you. Thank you.